So thank you for joining us here at the Mechanics Institute. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events, and we're really pleased to have you here for our program on Give Me Shelter, the Future of Housing in San Francisco, to discuss one of the most critical issues that we face here in the Bay Area. I'm also very pleased to welcome our moderator, John King, urban design critic of the San Francisco Chronicle, and our wonderful panel with James Pappas, Christine Johnson, Jonathan Moftikar, and David Rosen. Now, before we begin, I'd like to find out how many of you are new to the Institute. Who's never been here before? Any newcomers? No. All right. Well, looks like everyone knows all about us, so just remember to bring a friend to our next program and also invite them to come to our free tour of the Mechanics Institute Wednesday at noon. Um, and so we hope that Anyone who's watching us on Facebook will come on Wednesday at noon and get a nice introduction to the Mechanics Institute. Also, I'd like to mention that next Wednesday we have another really provocative topic. The author is Morgan Simon in conversation with activist Kath Delaney. Morgan's new book is Real Impact, The New Economics of Social Change. That's on October 26th at 6.30, all about how investment and activism can go together, and how finance can go for social good. So please join us for another great conversation next Thursday right here. And now let me introduce our panel and John King. Okay, uh, thank, thanks to all of you for coming to this. And most uh, moderators often will introduce someone by saying so-and-so needs no introduction. In this case, the topic needs no introduction. I mean, anyone who lives in the Bay Area or has lived here really going back into the 70s knows that this is an area where the cost of living has continued to be high, that routinely seems to be obscenely, impossibly high, and then it keeps going further. Uh, <coughs> the, the current the current market study here for San Francisco done by Vanguard Properties, which one of the panelists is with, shows that the median neighborhood value as of this month in Marina Cal Hollow is $1.595 million. In Mission Dolores, it's $1.2 million. In Coal Valley and Haight-Ashbury, it's $1.450 million. Put a very nice flower in your hair. Uh, in North Beach, it's down to 1.075 million, and Diamond Heights is a steal at just 830,000. And that's, I believe, condos. condos. Those are and condos. Single family is quite a bit higher. Yes, the the single family prices make that look like affordable housing. Uh, so, you know, in, in other words, if there's a been a change, I grew up in Walnut Creek and have. Uh, went to UC Berkeley and have been at the Chronicle since the early 90s. I mean, it's, you know, what I've seen in San Francisco is that really into the dot-com boom, there were still nooks and crannies where there was reasonably priced housing, you know, certainly for people wanting to just get to the city and be there and see what happened. Those places, you know, have been redefined. It's gone over, you know, now kind of San Leandro, San Pablo, you know, places like that start becoming the new frontier for artists, but they get real expensive too, and it just goes on and on and on. And so the question becomes, what can be done about it? What is being done about it? And then also the flip side, which is, you know, the people who have made the sacrifice to live here in financial things over the last decades, many of them will feel, well, we chose the Bay Area because of how we view the Bay Area, what the Bay Area is, and we don't want to trade that off for, you know, housing draping hillsides or things like that, or, you know, 20-story towers marching up Columbus Avenue. So, as again, this is old news. There's such a tension between the desire for affordable housing, the desire for reasonably priced housing so that all types of people can live here, 
versus the but wanting to protect the quality of life and the livability. And everything gets very politically charged. So that is going to be the kind of the framework for the topic tonight. Again, something everyone knows. And the Mechanics Institute has pulled together just a terrific quartet of people for the panel. I'm going to give very brief introductions. Um, and then I'll, but before, first I want to explain the format. There are not formal presentations. I'll be asking each of the panelists one question. They'll spend three or four minutes answering that question. We'll then shift to a general conversation. We'll then shift out to questions from the audience, and we'll wrap up at eight. So just to introduce the uh, panel, we're kind of marching this way to the end. Jonathan Moftakar is with Vanguard Properties. They are a group that does a lot of infill development in San Francisco. They also kind of watch the market. They do property management and property management, correct? As well. Yeah. Property management and just kind of watching the market. And David Paul Rosen, who has an office in Lafayette, he is very much involved in kind of every piece of the pie except working with the hammer out on the construction site. Uh, his firm works in deal structuring. It looks at renewable energy and energy efficiency housing. It has advised more than 300 municipalities and other forms of government. It's advised groups like the World Bank and UN Habitat on realms you know, from high policy to financial strategies and things. Christine Johnson kind of comes here under two auspices, though I will be asking her a question from only one of them <coughs> to begin with. Uh, she, is, she also has her hand in all sorts of things in the city. Uh, she's president of the board of the San Francisco Housing Development Corporation, which does a lot of work in the southeast area and the western edition. Um, she's on the San Francisco Planning Commission, which is certainly in the middle of all these issues and just about every other issue in the city. And she also, as of March 17th, became the director of the San Francisco Office of SPUR, a group that started in San Francisco but now is San Francisco, um, San Jose, and Oakland. Much more of an explicit regional look. She's running the San Francisco office. And then last of all is James Pappas, who is a policy planner focused on housing affor affordability at the planning department. He came from the California Housing Partnership Corporation. And one thing that's interesting to me is that I've covered planning either as covering planning or covering City Hall or being the architecture critic going back to the early 90s. And I don't recall a position quite like yours. Which kind of leads to the first question, which we're going to start with James and then come this way. And that would be, what is the city trying to do in terms, in a nutshell, and that's a hard, all these are hard <laughs> questions in a nutshell. What is the city trying to do to get the creation of housing moving more quickly at different levels? And how does the planning department fit into that, but also at the city level? Uh, so I think there's a, a range of things that have been happening. I mean, I think you can see that the volume of housing that's been produced has been increasing in recent years. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, but, you know, the mayor has just set a goal of, of sustaining a higher rate of housing production and has been asking the planning department, the building department, the various uh, departments that oversee the approvals process and uh, the inspection process for construction to make that process happen faster. And I'm sure many of my colleagues feel like, I don't know exactly how we're gonna do that because we're responding to a lot of processes that have developed over time um, and speak to a combination of local and state laws um, and, but we're going to do our best. So there's going to be new attention, uh, as I said, within the planning department, building department to, to those things. I think, uh, 
you know, we've laid groundwork through planning initiatives to um, create more room for housing in the city, which has been important. We've also created new programs like uh, the Accessory Dwelling Unit Program, ADU, um, the Home SF Program, which allows for uh, some increases in height and density in exchange for more affordable housing. So we're trying to pursue new policies that will uh, expand all types of housing for a range of people. Um, and then I think we've also seen a, a commitment to fund <coughs> affordable housing, which I think for those of us who, who are concerned about equity, we want to see a range of housing solutions. So we want to make sure that there's sufficient market rate housing coming online. And there's a lot of debate about what that looks like. I would say the most we can produce is what's sufficient, because there's a huge demand. But at the same time, we want to be producing for low and moderate income people who uh, still are going to struggle in the market. And so the bond issue that the Board of Supervisors recently placed on the ballot is an important part of uh, funding that, because I think we're going to need to accept that we're going to have to invest in affordable housing if we want to see the outcome, the diversity that we have in San Francisco con to continue. Great, thanks. Now, Christine, you were hired by Spur to run the San Francisco office. I, Spur recently, they, they have a very good magazine that comes out every month, every, every other month. month. The Urbanist, yep. Yeah, um, and they had a good look at what can you do to create more housing in San Jose, Oakland, and San Francisco. And the introduction by the overall head of Spur, Gabe Metcalf, uh, quoted from past Spur policy papers saying there's a housing crisis in San Francisco, you know, going back to 1981. Uh, that said, Spur has really been digging in on this and digging in on this in all the areas you're looking at. Why is this such, why is this such an important issue for a policy think tank that does a lot of thinking about the larger texture of the region? I mean, why, why is it worth kind of going back to again and again and again? Sure. So uh, I'd like to start off by saying that Spur is, uh, this is not new for Spur. I mean, Spur started after the 1906 earthquake, and its first iteration, its name was the San Francisco Housing Association, and its first output was one of the first zoning codes for San Francisco. And the reason was because there was slap shot housing in San Francisco that came up after the earthquake and fire, and people felt like there needed to be separation of uses and better building standards. And since then, housing has been part of the portfolio of all of the iterations of Spur. So this is not new. I would say uh, in the mid-90s, around 1996, there was a, a group of board members before Spur had staffed. It was mostly a working board that did all of the work. And they really said, now is the time to talk about how can we produce more housing just across the board. And so that really kind of kick-started the 20 year or so phase that we've been in, in really focusing on, on, on housing. Um, you referenced the last urbanist issue where uh, President and CEO Gabe Metcalf wrote an introduction. And I like the way that he started it. Essentially, he said, housing is the basis for all of our problems and it's the solution to many of our ills. Without housing for everyone, a roof over everyone's head, we can't solve inequality. We can't solve homelessness. It is something that will destroy the Bay Area, destroy our social fabric, destroy our economy if we are not able to put roofs over people's heads. And so whenever we talk about any of our policy areas, and SPUR covers about seven of them, it always comes back to housing. Um, and as a policy think tank, it's one thing to say housing drumbeat, but a lot of people do that. But one thing that SPUR is really great at is talking about across the region, why is it that there's not just one solution? Because I think if there were one solution, we would all agree on it, and then it would just happen. But it, as, as is the case, it's actually different in the three cities that we work on and across the region. So real quick, I'll close out with the three cities and kind of what we look at uh, each of them, and then you know we can get back to the discussion. So I'll start actually in San Jose. So in San Jose, they have a little bit of a different problem. They have a lot of companies that are out there. I mean, that's sort of like the, the home base of, of Silicon Valley, which is now have a lot of companies in San Francisco, but for the longest time, that's, that's not how it was. Um, and they have an issue with how do they 
uh, create more housing when they have such an influx of jobs that has been happening over the past 15 years or so. Um, and they focus much more in their discussions around how to create more housing about fiscalization of land use. And so how it is that their zoning code and other, uh, other laws uh, make it such that uh, commercial development is much more fiscally um, prudent sometimes a decision in terms of more revenue for a locality. And so that's been a real challenge for them in terms of how do they spur housing development when commercial development provides uh, so much sort of monetary benefit. So that's been the discussion there. In Oakland, it's a little bit different circumstance where it's actually like San Francisco where people want to talk about affordability, but they're a step back in terms of they don't actually have quite yet the development pressures that San Francisco has with a lot of parties who want to invest in Oakland. It's really challenging. The rents and the housing prices do not support the prices that market rate developers would need to get in order to pay the high construction costs and the high land costs. So you actually have a problem where feasibility of housing is a big issue, as well as people are talking about the housing that does come online, who is it affordable to? And then San Francisco, again, we have our, you know, our, our discussion really is about affordability. You know, we are a place where people want to invest. We are a place where people want to move. And it's about making sure that people aren't displaced and that everyone is able to afford a roof over their head. So those three areas have different policy sort of tweaks in terms of like, why is it that housing isn't being produced and what are the issues that they focus on? And I think SPUR does a really good job of, um, of illuminating that. Okay. Now, David, <clears throat> You know, this area thinks, oh my gosh, the Bay Area is getting ravaged by housing prices. And that's true. But um, you can go to <clears throat> Boston, you can go to New York, you can go to increasingly places like Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Seattle, Portland. I mean, it's a different scale, but there are a lot of metropolitan regions being pressured right now. Are there unique aspects to the to the problems we face here, and then to what extent do the resources even exist? Well, I think one way to think about uh, how crushing uh, this problem is uh, for our region, and to put it in some context, perhaps nationally, if not internationally, is to quickly summarize the sort of demographics of the region, and to translate that to what people and families can afford to pay, and what it costs to buy or rent here. And then as you ask, John, what, what the resources are that we have available, as James outlined some of the efforts of the city, um, but looking at this in totality among local government, the state government, which has passed some promising new legislation, the national, federal legislation, and the private sector. So really quickly, the median income in San Francisco for a family of four, anybody want to take a guess at what that is today? How much? Nope. Nope. $115,000 for a family of four. And what that translates into a long established federal and state policy defining so called very low income families, very low income, at 50% of the area median income is a family of four's income of $56,000. So I, I'm not sure if you went up to someone on the street and asked them, and they earn $56,000, would you say, you know, sir or madam, did you know you're very low income? I'm not sure they would have agreed with that statement. Extremely low income, okay, the label, is translated as 35% of area median income, $40,000. That's close to three times an SSI level of income when we get down to the homeless or near homeless populations. What those families can afford, a median income family at 115, uh, generally, uh, using underwriting standards of the private sector, can afford a home at about half a million dollars. That's one third of the median priced home in the city. Or put another way, it would require a one million dollar per unit capital subsidy to render that unit affordable. On the rental side, uh, at 50% or half of the median income, the affordable rent's about $1,200, maybe $1,100. Median rent in the city for a two-bedroom is running about $3,000? I would say probably a bit higher. It depends on new construction. For a two-bedroom? Yeah, somewhere. Yeah. 
So you can see these gaps are, are critical, and, and Christine mentioned the uh, issue of resources. So, so what do we have to play with here? Uh, the largest historical program of any state in the country was here in California for 30 years, redevelopment. And it produced between half a million, half a billion, and two billion a year in subsidies for the entire state over a 30-year period. And during a 17-year stretch, the entire state produced 98,000 affordable units with 20 billion in subsidy, an average of 20, 200,000 a door. The new so-called Housing Trust Fund adopted and signed by the governor this year was initially proposed by our firm in 1982. It was a while ago. And it's going to produce about $250 million in annual revenue. It's not that we don't have the resources, it's that they're misdeployed. So the last point I want to make here is, um, does anyone know what the largest housing subsidy in the state and the United States is? Exactly. The mortgage interest rate, property tax deduction, and capital gains exclusion for principal residents. In the state of California, that costs the taxpayers of the state $10 billion a year and is regressively distributed to households earning above $100,000 and $200,000 a year. 25% of that amount, almost $3 billion, goes to families earning more than $200,000 a year. So if we simply made a slight adjustment of, say, 20%, we could do a budget-neutral shift of renewable re uh, revenue sources for affordable housing to the tune of the highest level of redevelopment funding in the state's history, $2 billion a year. That's without dinging the budget a dime. So we do have capital available if we had the political will. And you know, it's worth noting that the much-touted, with reason, the much-touted housing package just signed by the governor, a cause for some um, optimism, didn't pretend to touch this very large um, tax subsidy that's regressively distributed. Okay. Uh, that'll be tackled after Prop 13 is worked out. <laughs> yeah. Go on. Uh, well, Christine raised a very interesting <coughs> issue, which is the fiscalization of land use. That is not no, just we'll, the San we'll, Jose issue. Yeah, that's, no, we'll, that's a critical we'll, problem. We will get we to that raised. later. Um, so, Jonathan, I have a question. At Vanguard, uh, if you look at the Vanguard website, a number of smaller projects in the 10 to 50 unit range, up to 75 or so. Yes. Um, just real quick, what's it like to build in San Francisco in terms of, you know, these are not the towers in Rincon Hill. These are the gas station that's now a five-story condo building or a five-story apartment building. So, so what does it take in the city of San Francisco to turn that and I'm sorry for changing the question, but it's kind of a... That's all right. Yeah. What does it take to turn that from bare land into, you know, now open? Well, it is quite nuanced, as you might expect, and there is a lot of opportunity there because many of the established neighborhoods in the city have sites that, like the, one you mentioned, the ones you mentioned, which are gas stations or commercial buildings that are not currently being used uh, to the fullest extent. And so... What the city has done and what developers have taken uh, the opportunity to do is to take those sites, those infill sites as we discussed, and convert them into housing. And that's usually five or six stories depending on the zoning, but you could, you could easily say that would be uh, likely in the neighborhoods. Um, m many in the city feel that, they, that the neighborhoods should be preserved. And, and in fact, when you look at the height limits in these neighborhoods, they are in fact lower than Rincon Hill and right. Soma, et cetera, in order to preserve that fabric. And I, I think that is usually something most people agree with within San Francisco as far as that context. However, the, the issue is, is that you still have to produce a lot of housing. And these sites, which we, we as Vanguard Properties have been involved with, we just finished a 50-unit building off 6th and Jesse. Uh, that's more of a SOMA location, but there are plenty in the city, as you discuss. Uh, they don't actually offer the opportunity to build that many. But to answer your, that many units in comparison to, say, Pier 70 right. or Treasure Island or um, Hunter's Point Shipyard, Candlestick, 
There are 40,000 units currently approved to be built, and the majority of those thousands of units are, in fact, in areas that are not these infill neighborhoods like Coal Valley, the, the Marina, the Mission, et cetera. But the challenges, as to, to answer your question directly, are that neighborhood groups still oppose these sorts of developments, regardless of what city policy and city planners feel is the best for the city, because they may have different goals than the developer and the city in that sense. So that's a, that's a very simplistic way of, of answering that. And we have CEQA, which is a great way for neighborhood groups and people generally opposed to new projects to address their concerns and fight developments. And what you have is lengthy entitlement processes. And for those of you in the room who don't know what entitlement means, that's the general term used to describe allowing um, a developer to build that five-story, 30-unit building in the, on that site. They have to go through those city processes, right? So when you delay that and you add to the um, review and the architect's fees and whatever other fees are involved, soft costs as they're called, ultimately the developer, in order to take that risk, and including market cycles, so, so for example, they might start that process in a good economy, but if the, if the economy tanks, they can't build that building anymore. So they've now taken on that risk. So they wrap that all up, and they want 11, 12, 13, 14, $1,500 a square foot. Otherwise, they won't build, as they won't in Oakland. So it, it, it's, a, it's a challenging uh, prospect. However, there are local developers in San Francisco, and I've heard San Francisco is far more nuanced than LA or New York. I don't know because I haven't worked in those jurisdictions. But uh, there are local developers who, who are very well versed at how to work the system and how to actually get something done in this city. And those are the ones who you see turning out these projects. But can the time frame, the mayor has a goal of shortening the time frames. Can they be shortened? And would that benefit the city as a whole? I think from a city policy perspective, as far, far as production is concerned, it would. I want to, um, we're now going to shift to more of a conversation, uh, but first I want to do a quick follow-up with you two and then more of the conversation. Um, and I, I was talking a little bit about this with James, is that on the one hand, the city is really pushing, we need to build a lot more housing. And look at all these needs, look at, all, you know, you can measure them in so many ways. The flip side is actual projects you want to fit into the fabric of the neighborhood. There's a lot of definition of what the fabric should be. I hear from architects or developers who say just, you know, the amount of time a design takes to get fiddled with chews up a lot of time, and that's even if there's no objection to a project. Is there a tension between the policy goals and the kind of quality of the urban fabric concerns? And should there, in fact, be one because we're building the city that is going to be the city of 20 and 40 years from now? Or do we get so wrapped up in the ideal at the planning level that we trip over ourselves? <laughs> I'd say off the record, Awkward. except it's on Facebook Live. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you've probably seen more of this. I mean, I've been at the planning department just a little over a year, so I'm sure Christine has been witness to many of these nuanced conversations. So i let you take the lead if you want to. Oh, no, I want to hear your staff. I want to hear you say first. <laughs> well, I mean, I think there clearly is a tension there, and, and there probably needs to be a tension there. I mean, we do want to uh, encourage housing production, but we have a long history in the city of being very cautious about our urban form and urban design. Um, I think, you know, if there is an issue that, I mean, there may be process points that I don't know all the details of because I don't work directly with the urban design. We have some great architects who help review projects. And, but I think, you know, maybe even some of them would say, and I'm speaking for myself, but just sort of the conversations that I've heard and what I've seen is that maybe we need to move more towards a form-based code where it is clearer what you can do and what you can't. And there's just clearer direction. And so that the person who's coming in with a project knows, you know, they've had a clearer sense of what we're looking for. 
And there is, there is still a lot of room for adjustment that happens through that urban design process or before the commission. And it can get very nuanced and detailed. And you know, so helping uh, us as staff pull back, be able to pull back from some of that stuff, but providing more guidance for people uh, in the code. Because there are ambiguous things. There are things that are open to interpretation. And so that's when you get into these kind of time-consuming back and forth sort of things. Sure. So I'll follow up uh, quickly there. So um, for folks, my, you know, I like to always start with first principles, like how did we get here? Why is this the case? Um, I like to break it down into two things. The first one is in our um, charter, basically. Every department that issues any sort of permit has discretion in whether to issue that permit or revoke it or change it or, or do anything they want uh, or, or deny it for any reason at all. And I say that because the way that that translates to the planning department is that there then becomes a culture citywide, but also in the planning department, that if you are going to approve a permit, you want to make sure that you really thought through all your, you dotted your I's, crossed your T's, really thought through and used your discretion to make the best decision possible versus in many other cities, the building code is the building code. As long as it signs off on X, Y, and Z that it says in the building code, check, 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 here's your permit, here you go. So we have a different culture because of, of, of how our city is set up. So that's number one. Uh, the second thing is our general plan and our planning code do have a lot of places where it's really ambiguous. And sometimes we have even areas that contradict each other. And so again, it just sets up a circumstance where you require that discretion from the department. Um, and because of that, uh, the department wants to get to do a good job. There's a lot of process that comes in terms of review and interpretation and going back and forth before you even get to the commission, which ultimately approves or denies in a hearing or, uh, or delegates that responsibility to staff for various projects. So I don't know if that's, I hope that's helpful for people in terms of understanding like why is it that there's so much discretion? Why is it that there's so much ambiguity? Why do things uh, take so long? And I think your question was, what can we do about it? Um, it's kind of, is that kind of the way it should be? Or yeah. is that the way that it is and you're flummoxed at how to change it? Yeah, you know, I would say, um, having seen hundreds of projects, even in my time on the commission, I'm not always the, sure that that's the way it should be. When I look at the outcome of so many of our projects, even especially the ones where there's a lot of agreement and a lot of um, people feel like they were good decisions, I sometimes question whether or not all of the process was necessary. Some of the things that we see um, that are good elements, I sort of wonder, is there a train that we can just sort of do a review and write some of these things into our urban design guidelines or into our planning code? Are there things that we can clarify? Do we need to have the same level and round of back and forth just to end up in the same place? Like there are certain building elements and certain design elements and certain ways that buildings interact with the, with the street level that are consistent in all of the projects that people end up being happy with. And I sort of wonder sometimes, can we just write that stuff into our planning code so that it's not having to go around and around every single time to end up in the same place. So I sometimes, I sometimes wonder about that. Um, but I do think that we have a special fabric in San Francisco because of the level of community engagement we have. Um, and there's some times when I don't know that that's the reason why we have such a housing backlog. Um, we just mentioned there was 40,000 units that have been entitled approved, ready to go in the ground, and there's other reasons why they haven't been constructed. And most of the city doesn't even build to the allowable zoning, let alone talking about up zonings. So that, you know, there's a lot of other reasons other than that piece. And now, and now um, conversation, talking about the need is more apparent. Um, James talked a little bit about the mayor with the executive order and trying to move things along. David talked about some of the changes in Sacramento. I mean. Do the four of you sense that there are shifts in terms of the need for housing be, to become more, is housing becoming more of a practical urgency to get it built than the, gee, we really need to do something? In other words, do you, you know, do the four of you see changes that are likely to really kind of build up some momentum? I'm going to say no. 
I mean, I've been at this for 37 years, and we had the same conversations in 1980, and we had the same affordability gaps, and we had the same lack of resources. Um, we had a president who cut HUD's budget by two-thirds and he created something called homelessness for the first time and who as governor uh, deinstitutionalized the mentally ill and uh, contributed to another component of the homeless problem. I, I think in San Francisco specifically, which geographically, right, is landlocked. I mean, we have no place to go but up. And let's be blunt about that. No place to go but up. Now, L.A. actually is also, believe it or not, an entirely built city. And they have no place to go but up. So, you know, John's concern about do we lose some of the character of the city, James's comment about form-based code, which I think deserves um, maybe some unpacking if folks aren't clear about that. And, and Christine's, you know, wonderful summary of uh, the challenge. I mean, having worked in about 300 jurisdictions, I'm not sure there is, with the exception of maybe New York, a place that's a bit more difficult than San Francisco. I mean, there are good ways to, to address this. The land use and circulation element in Santa Monica, I would suggest, is a model. Um, the idea of a form-based code that, well, we, we kind of get the height and bulk and the setbacks, and we just agree that, that these are going to be the height and bulk and setback um, standards that we'll accept and we might step it up for an affordability incentive. And we can calibrate that economically. We know how to do that. And, and that would eliminate a ton of the back and forth and the uncertainty. The, the worst part of the complexity and length of the process from a developer's perspective is uncertainty. Mm -hmm. If we can inject some certainty into the process, um, that will help a lot. And Jonathan? Yeah, you, you, you had mentioned in one of your sample questions that you sent to us the, the mission moratorium. And <clears throat> I, I want to start off by answering your question directly, which is I agree um, in the sense that I don't see a great urgency on the part of anybody within the realm of the city in um, addressing this quote-unquote crisis. Um, you do see efforts like the mission housing moratorium. One of the interesting points about and that... And just real quick, this was the ballot measure a year or two ago to essentially ban new market rate housing in the Mission District. Correct. Or have a moratorium on it. Right. And one of the things that the city did is The Economist put out a report analyzing the potential effects of the limiting new construction, mark, new market rate construction, which is what the proponents of this moratorium had in mind. It was the, the intention would be that any new production in the mission would be only mar uh, below market rate or, or something of the like, but predominantly below market rate. And <clears throat> the economists, in fact, proved this to be um, an, an inaccurate assumption that this would prevent evictions or it would um, perhaps lower the cost of housing or whatever other goals there might have been. I think with, with a neighborhood like the Mission, continuing with this example, the, the tide has already changed because, as the market report states, the price per foot is already $1,000 as a median and, of course, could be quite higher as an average in and, and, and certain instances. So how, how do we make, address this urgent situation? And that's, a, that's really a matter of opinion, and I think you'd get probably hundreds of them. I don't know, but I'm, I'm just kind of curious. Do you see... Do you see neighborhood people saying, you know, I wish it was two stories shorter, but geez, I worry about where my kid's going to live, so go ahead and build it. Maybe this will bring things down. Or realistically, when it comes to specific projects, is I think it as tough as it's ever been? The planning effort is, is too specific to the neighborhoods and not looking at the overall goals of the city. So that it, it, I, think, I think what you could achieve in these neighborhoods is somewhat more height, and certainly in areas that have a transportation network. For example, in the mission, on Mission Street between 16th and 24th, you have hardly any new um, housing in a very transit-rich area. The existing zoning is between six and eight stories. Could that be 12 stories? Could it be double? I don't know. You, you'd have to look at that. The city is looking at upzoning the hub, which is right around Market and Van Ness, and <clears throat> there is potential to add hundreds of units in, in that location. So 
I don't, I, I do agree in the sense that cities are vertical and I do think that cities do change. And I, I believe that San Francisco's existing framework of planning helps to protect the, the character of the neighborhoods. I don't think that that's at risk. But I think the urgency here is looking at how we can add ultimately more units, thousands more units. There were 20,000 units in the last five years and um, a lot of that in SOMA. As an example, the rental prices in, have gone down about 5% in areas like SOMA with production. So if, if the production was something like 40,000 units, would that have allowed rental prices to come down 10%, 15%? That's a question. Can I, uh, I want to make a plea here for children. Um, of the largest 100 metropolitan regions in the United States, which municipality has the lowest percentage of children living in it? Anybody know what that percentage is of the population? 11 percent. Um, and so the, the challenge with new, con new construction is the market produces virtually zero units with more than two bedrooms, uh, which are insufficient to house families. And I, I gave you the stats on what a median family earning 115 grand can afford. It's a million short of the median priced home. So I, 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 I'd like the housing discussion here and the affordability challenge to also embrace the particular challenge of housing families with children. It's not to say there aren't other special needs groups, the elderly, uh, development and disabled, and the homeless and others. Uh, but I think that often gets left out, John, when we're talking about production. So I think that's, that's one point we should focus on here. Um, and I, I think the, the other issue here is um, this notion of being so landlocked. We, we really are between a rock and a hard place, literally, in San Francisco. I don't envy you your job on the commission, and nor yours at the department. Um, and if San Francisco's can agree on you know, what that, through the general plan, right, what the ultimate population is going to be, then we're just going to have to deal with that. And because we are landlocked, and because we have a, uh, an end game of production, um, we're going to have to address the issue of long-term affordability through subsidies. There, there really isn't another way to do it, because the production will not solve the crisis in affordability for those at 80, 50, and 30%. Meaning it'll only be at the very edges, mm -hmm. and it'll be the very top edges. So if rents go down five percent in Mission Bay, great, right? Thirty-five hundred to thirty-two hundred, and I just gave you the economics mm -hmm. of that. So um, one myth that we have is that production will solve the problem of affordability, and it will only do so at the very narrowest of margins at the top end. So let me ask though. So, um, should we be looking at this as a San Francisco issue? I mean, my wife and I lived in the inner sunset in the early 90s. We wanted to buy a house. We didn't want to buy a house in the fog, so we looked in Potrero Hill and Bernal Heights and then, you know, and Glen Park, and we were kind of seeing houses that kind of, we kind of liked, we could kind of afford. Somebody said, oh, you should check out North Berkeley, you know. We got a really nice little bungalow in North Berkeley. We've lived happily ever since. I got a job at the Chronicle, and I'm at work in half an hour. Uh, I mean, is there a way to think about this regionally, re regionally <laughs> or is the issue that every municipality sees itself as unique, that Lafayette sees it, okay, well, this is an issue that's Lafayette's. Walnut Creek sees it that way. Marin County certainly sees it that way. I mean, should we be thinking about, you know, that this is a regional issue? Yeah. So, okay. so yes. And it's funny. I think that uh, actually of the however many hundreds of cities there are in the nine counties of the Bay Area, a good deal of them have leadership that are... Uh, that do think regionally about this. And they do think that this is a, something that you have, we have to be creating housing uh, all across the board for all of our residents across the region. The problem is that doesn't translate into individual decisions that are made by individual municipalities with their own zoning codes, their own planning codes, their own sets of, of, of advocates uh, and neighborhood groups and others who engage in the process. So um, the idea of regionalism 
sort of breaks down when everyone has to make their own decisions within their own boundaries and, and because of Prop 13 and other, um, other constraints, uh, there are, there is a lot more for an individual municipality to consider than just are we creating enough housing. So, you know, one, I think we need to think about a regional governance system before we can think about how can we truly um, collaborate regionally. <clears throat> we can have goals, but again, every city has to do their own thing because that's the way that we're structured. So it's a little bit challenging. I think people think regionally, but they act locally. And I just want to add, uh, we, we had a, a, a presentation actually to the housing production in the 90s and 2000s is about half what it was in the 70s. So this production, regionally, regionally, and a lot of the production that has occurred was, uh, you know, especially in the 80s, 90s, was in that kind of outer uh, parts of the Bay Area, outer Contra Costa, Solano County. And San Francisco has actually really stepped up production in the 2000s, but we, we had very little housing production throughout most of the 80s and 90s. However, the region now has dropped off as well. And so I think we, we need to recognize this sort of broad regional trend and think about how we can encourage other cities and, and work for these either, either through regional governance or just mechanisms that are going to push us to do what we need to do. But the flip side of the current situation is that where we can, what we can actually control is here. Mm -hmm. And we do need to, I think, model uh, appropriate housing policy for the region because we are still one of the leaders for, you know, people look to us, although I th sometimes they look to us and they're like, oh, San Francisco, you know. <laughs> but I think, you know, we are, we are uh, obviously one of the major cities and so we have to set a tone. So I think across a range of housing policies, that's what we're trying to do more and more at the planning department. Um, but I fully agree with Christine that we need more effective regional systems and state systems. Well, I, you know, the three mayors, right, of the three largest cities in the region uh, couldn't agree more on this issue uh, and are, have been very proactive in their own cities uh, to try to effectuate an affordable housing strategy and a greater production. Uh, but again, I think uh, looking over decades, and you know, Spur goes back, as Christine uh, rightfully reminds us, to 1906. But look, looking back over the decades of debate, and it is definitely seen as a regional issue, John, and we have state legislation that dates from the 70s that declares it a regional issue. We have ABAG, the Association of Bay Area Governments, which forecasted a need for 187,000 new units in the nine-county Bay Area from 2014 to 2022. But the fact of the matter is, of the 140-odd jurisdictions in the nine counties, they're going to go their own way. And I think the notion that we're going to see individual cities give up their sovereign rights over building permits is a pipe dream. So what can we do about that if we accept that? And, and maybe I'm more pessimistic than my colleagues. But if that's at least a concern, one issue would be what we've started to do in Sacramento, which is, look, if you're going to have, say, a form-based code or you're going to have a general plan with designated densities and um, you come along and, and propose to build within those density limits, you're entitled. No questions asked. And if the jurisdiction denies the, in, the, denies the permit, you have a right to sue the jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. That would be a big advance. Commonly and known as as of right, correct? As correct. of right. Yeah, that would be a huge advance, but it requires state legislation. Well, we uh, kind of have that. The, the, this, you could do it here, I guess, to a, you, to a degree. Yeah, so the Housing Accountability Act, which passed in 2014 and was strengthened this year in the package of housing bills, allows developers to sue cities that uh, deny housing projects. So how does it work, Christine, mm -hmm. given the the citizen input process that you, you know, uh, unpacked for us a few minutes ago? I mean, well, it's, it's really challenging. It's actually happening right now. So as a city planning commissioner, we often have hearings where the city attorney, who sits kind of <laughs> below the dais on the <clears throat> left, will furrow her brow and, <laughs> and, and look at us and shake her finger. Well, she doesn't shake a finger. That doesn't happen. But <laughs> what happens is whenever we have a commission hearing and there's a project before us that, let's say, uh, has 15 units, and we start saying, well, we think there's too much shade or we don't like it, so let's shave it back, you know, maybe 10 feet on this side and 10 feet on that side, and then the result is a loss of units. The city attorney will say, Housing Accountability Act, 
Um, it is legally, uh, uh, it, we are in legal jeopardy when we shave off projects or, or use our discretion to change a project that would result in a reduction of units, and that's state law. Right, so right. The, the other state law provision is the housing element law, uh, which provides for this regional housing needs uh, and invests the state housing community on the department with the power to invalidate a city's general plan if it is found in noncompliance with regional housing need production. This statute dates to the 70s. How often has it been used? Never. Never. <laughs> Never. And so uh, putting teeth into that, that that's a, and, and maybe we should look at the 2014 Act, Christine, and you know, folks like you and Spur, both wearing your planning commission hat and policy hat, can strengthen the effectiveness of that mm -hmm. statute. But I think, John, looking at the housing element law with um, giving some real state power, I'm given this crisis, to at least provide this as of right um, authority uh, in the, as an alternative to the notion of regional government. Let, let's, flip the, let's flip this around, though, a little bit. I mean, it does get back to people will say, I am in the Bay Area because of this wonderful mix of open space, because San Francisco has these unique neighborhoods. You know, the notion of quality of life is very different than the notion of quantitative need. One reason for all the process in San Francisco is the sense back in the 60s and 70s that the fabric of the city that made it a distinct place was under threat from urban renewal, from towers, from insensitive development in neighborhoods. Now you can, and also places like Berkeley have certainly done this. I mean, you can quarrel with it, but that's a very solid argument. I mean, realistically, you know, there are a lot of state parks you could also in the Bay Area say, do we really need that many gentle hillsides? Uh, you know, I mean, how does how does the undeniable crisis make inroads against the process and the passionate feelings that well, we we want this place to have the unique aspect it does. Well, yeah. One, if I could, if I may, <clears throat> one of the uh, points that organizations like Spur and others similar to it make is that the the greatest opportunity to preserve the environment is densification of urban centers as opposed to urban sprawl, mm -hmm. which used to be more of the framework and probably still is the framework in other states. And so where do you do that? Well, we have plenty of opportunity. We have opportunity in San Jose. We have opportunity in Oakland. We have opportunity in San Francisco. As Christine <coughs> mentioned, there are 40,000 units approved in San Francisco. Why are people not building those units? So that's an opportunity. Why are, what, what can be done in Oakland to encourage residential developers to build? And, and they have started to in this cycle, but l late. But this does get to what David had mentioned, that we also want different types of housing. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, the reason I'm raising this is that it's so, and this is the reason we're in the bind we're in. It is so tough. I mean, I, you know, just real quick, and then I want to finish this up and then go to the shorter questions. It was striking with a bag and the... Are there short questions? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. It's not an easy <laughs> issue. Right. You know, the whole issue of Plan Bay Area, which is a pretty well-meaning but fairly innocuous effort to start trying to think about regionally how do you do this. The way it was being depicted is stack and pack housing are going to blanket the hillsides of the Tri-Valley. And, you know, it's tough. I mean, it does run into this real challenge of people saying, well, why do I need density? I think... Uh you know, when I think about San Francisco, and I'm from San Francisco, and so I've seen it, you know, 40 years of uh, its evolution. Um, I, I think when I think of density here, I think of it, it sort of intensifying what makes San Francisco great. I don't think of destroying it. Um, and I, you know, I think there's a lot that we can do through design uh, through through good planning, where even if a, a neighborhood shifts to having more six, eight, ten-story buildings, it can still be contextual, it can still add to the fabric, or where uh, higher rises are 
going in, that can also be done in a way that r works. So, um, you know, when you think of uh, Barcelona or Paris, which are very similar in size to San Francisco, and they're more than double the density, two to three times San Francisco's density. So I really don't think a denser place is a less livable place. And I think we sometimes confuse quality of life with a lifestyle. People are used to a certain way of, oh, there's more parking. or there's, I mean, that's a lifestyle. It doesn't necessarily mean it's, a, it's the only way to live or the best way to live. So I think we have to be open to thinking about um, how to square those things. And I would just make a uh, last mention of something that sort of goes back to one of your previous questions of do people perceive this as a crisis and as a going, you know, again, keeping the commissioner hat on because we sit up there for like 12 hours every Thursday, so you see a lot of stuff. You your know, place is secure in heaven. Okay. Oh, man. <laughs> Doing I, that duty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I will not call myself a martyr, but others may. Well, then, <laughs> I, thought, I thought you just were. No. no, no. Um, so I'll give a quick example of like the way I see the culture in San Francisco changing that's going to be helpful for this discussion about quality of life versus lifestyle. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Yimby movement, but one of the uh, sort of heads of that movement, Laura Clark, often comes to planning commission hearings. And recently, she has uh, declared a vendetta against single family home zoning. And I won't get into it, but I w what I will say is that at one point she made a public comment that basically went into all of the reasons why RH1 or single family home zoning is bad and needs to go away. And in previous years, you could totally imagine what the following public <coughs> commenter would have said. Something to the effect of that person wants to destroy the city. Something to the effect of this person wants to destroy our way of life. They want to Manhattanize San Francisco. You can, you can go through the litany of responses that someone else may come behind. But that's not what happened. Someone came behind who started off by saying, uh, I totally disagree with her. I think that there is a place for single-family homes in San Francisco, uh, but then qualified it by saying, but I do believe that we need to create housing. We're in a crisis. We need to be you know, basically putting roofs over people's heads. And I think that that qualification is a symptom of a cultural shift in San Francisco that's really important. And, and I mentioned before that we can create thousands and thousands of units without a single more upzoning. I think we should be doing some. I think there's places where we should be <coughs> denser. But there's a lot of areas where the heights are 40 or 60 feet, and the buildings in those areas are nowhere near that. And you could get in units all across the board without really changing a, a lot of our neighborhoods in terms of their character and their feel and how people feel living there. <laughs> Can I add a comment? <laughs> Super quick. Um, LA uh, upzoned these long corridors, right? LA is these long arterial boulevards, and um, expected uh, with the upzoning, these were commercial strips, one story, uh, abutting single family and neighborhoods that are low density, typical to what you see in, in LA. And what happened was nothing. And the reason for that was the expectations of the property owners of those single story retail strips with their value were way out of whack with what. The market was prepared to provide, and uh, it, it was a case of you know the zoning was in place, but the market was nowhere near uh, able to deliver. Great, and and so I want to ask: we're going to have two round robin, real quick response from each, and then go to questions. Um, one thing is, each of you, just real quick, what would you say is the biggest misconception? about the housing crisis in San Francisco and the Bay Area? For me, for me that's, an, that's an easy answer, which is that the tech sector causes it. I, I believe if it weren't the tech sector, it would be the finance sector or the healthcare sector or some sector. Any strong city has a strong economic base, and it, it doesn't necessarily have to be the tech sector, as I mentioned. Um, that, that, that would be the answer. Great. Yeah. David. Production will solve our affordability crisis. <laughs> Christine. Uh, that not producing housing will keep neighborhoods affordable. Okay. <laughs> 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 
Well, I'm just going <laughs> to, yeah. <laughs> and mine uh, was going to be the combination of these two. Well, I, I, thought think, we just, I thought we just combined them. And they, Come on, I, don't think the, I don't think they cancel each other out. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. So I think that people underestimate how badly we've underproduced housing and how much of a difference we could make, especially for the sort of middle income people if we were producing more. But I think David's absolutely right that to reach people in that low end of the income spectrum, it, the, the market's going to solve everything is not going to solve everything. Okay. And then the second question, we'll start there and come this way. <clears throat> if there's like kind of a single change you could make, and you're allowed to have two if you want, but basically one or two simple changes, you are the czar of San Francisco or the czar of the Bay Area, you can do whatever <laughs> is needed here to really make a dent in this, what would it be? So I'm going to cop out on this a little bit and just say that I think broadly what I would love to see is a little is more alignment between uh, just bringing together of the what we say we want in our outcomes and our actions in terms of policy investment, et cetera. Because I think as you've heard tonight, there is a lot of confusion and sort of mixed signals, and I think if we could really think about our approach on a range of issues and how that's, where is that getting us? That's really the thing that I think would drive a lot of change and reconsidering of, of all these little things. I could, I could rattle off different things that I think we should do, but honestly, I mean, to me, that's the, the missing piece is we are not really thinking, where do we want to get to? And does this align with where we want to get to? And Christine, okay. real simple, boom. Boom. I'm taking two. Um, <laughs> first one is a requirement that cities maximize their current zoning, whatever that may be. And the second is that we broaden our revenue base for subsidizing affordable housing so that we don't have to focus as much on extraction from new development as the only way to fund affordable housing. Okay, so I get two. Because um, <laughs> you got two. Um, the first is uh, absolutely with Christine uh, that we have to um, restructure and redistribute the current subsidies that we're spending on housing to make it more progressive at the extremely low and very low income ends. We talked about California. The picture in Washington is much worse. It's 185 billion a year for the mortgage interest property tax deduction, and it's much more regressively distributed. And the second would be, and this is third rail stuff, right? But we really have to, uh, we have to address Prop 13. Uh, because uh, I made a short comment about uh, Christine's notion of San Jose and fiscalization. This is a statewide problem. It's not a San Jose problem. And what it really means uh, is that uh, cities cannot afford to permit housing. Because the fiscal impact of producing housing from a city government perspective is negative cash flow. And as anyone who tries to run a business understands, you cannot run a business with negative cash flow. And so what that has caused us to do as a state is over-retail the state, although uh, online, um, you know, online say, gambling, what? Online the, buying the is now, is taking yeah, Amazon is changing that, that model and we're seeing malls dying as a result. But those two issues, um, uh, redistributing what we currently spend on housing to make it more progressive and having the political courage as a state to solve this quagmire that we're in as a result of Prop 13. I think my answer will be uh, local, more so San Francisco, and probably reiter reiterate a couple of points, which is that the planning process, I believe, is a deterrent to production. And I would seek to have the uh, typical timeline of two to three years maybe on average. I don't know what the average is. Uh, Christine might. But I would say six months to a year. And I, I realize that in the current framework that's highly unlikely. But that would, I think, be a great solution since I am the, the housing czar at the moment. And the second would be, once again, cities are about verticality. And when, when you're in a, an area like the Bay Area, which does have its beautiful natural preserves, which we do intend to keep and we will keep, thanks to those people in the 60s and 70s who spearheaded those efforts, we must allow, accommodate population growth because people have a right to be here just as you and I are here. 
How do you do that? You have to densify cities. And I'm not saying build 25-story um, structures in Coal Valley. I'm saying allow for a greater density, two to three stories in neighborhoods like Coal Valley, you know, ten, ten, five to ten more stories in neighborhoods like, uh, like I mentioned, on the Mission Corridor between 16th and 24th. You have to allow people to build units or production because, um, as Christine mentioned, affordable housing, and, and David, uh, to, is, is a very complicated process to, and, and extraction from developers has, has actually, in a way, curtailed production because there's a lot of uncertainty on the part, uh, the way, on the part of a developer um, as far as what, what can be built when the percentages are changing, that sort of thing. I'm getting a little too complicated, okay. so anyhow, I'll give it back to you. Wait a minute, that way, he got seven. How no, no, that? no, 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 no. No, that was seven. It was, was a little bit of long-winded second one, that's all. But, okay. but, but so basically, time limit, if it's not approved within, a, if it's not settled within six, six months, months to a year, I would say. You just get your project, <laughs> fix 13. Well, and, and change the revenue stack. We, we need more capital to render housing affordable because it oh, is a that's myth. Right. Okay, so Prop 13 we, and... We need the fiscal juice to make this work, John. Otherwise, we're wasting our time here because we're not going to even touch the problem without that level of capital investment. Think about things in a more rational way and have people see things in the middle. Good luck well, in today's align, America. Just align, you know, state what you want to achieve and see if things and align Christine, to that. Just to, <laughs> Maximize just zoning and maximum. broaden the revenue base for affordable right. housing. So nobody said convert regional parks to mobile home parks. <laughs> oh, just want to keep that oh, clear. Well, no, no. Wait, can back. we? Can oh, we get... Too late. <laughs> okay, so we have about 20 minutes for questions. And, <clears throat> uh, you know, I want to thank all the panelists right now. I could have blathered on even more than I did. I smiled once or twice just remembering entertaining stories I wasn't going to tell. Uh, so we will, we've, got a, we've got a microphone back here, but we're going to start with this man in the front. One, two, three. And keep your questions short, and um, I'll kind of steer them unless you yeah, have I'm curious. Uh, it seems like all the problems and solutions uh, are related to about one-third of San Francisco. The south it made the northeast side of San Francisco. Nothing on the other side of Twin Peaks. Nothing past Bernal Hill. Everything is in the Mission and Soma and Baby Dog Patch. But nothing out in the sunset. There's no problems in the sunset. There's no solutions in the sunset. <laughs> there are no homeless in the sunset or Pacific Heights or... Okay, you know, the question. Yes. Or was so, it more a statement? So does someone have a, uh, the ability to move some of the solutions out of the Mission District to a different part of San Francisco? Well, uh, Katie Tang um, had proposed in the wet, in, I, I believe her district is the Sunset. Is yeah. that right? Yeah, That's her, yeah she had proposed um, Home SF, which has now actually passed, which allows developers on commercial corridors correct me if I'm um, misstating this, to build two to three stories additional. These are areas where there's, um, you know, a major transit line like the light rail or the buses um, in order to densify those commercial corridors on the western side of the city. Um, she, she actually did a pretty extensive planning process where she identified specific, uh, I believe she, you call them soft sites, soft where you identify the potential for uh, specific developments and housing to be built on sites like a one-story bank, for example, building a little retail shop to where you would have the retail, but then you would have housing built on top, um, so, uh, keeping the, the retail fabric as well. So there has, there has been an effort on her part, but I agree with you in the sense that it has not been a concerted <coughs> effort. It's not the southern part of the city, per se, that I've heard of. There are odds and ends developments, and the developers... They don't see a lot of money to be made in those neighborhoods, so they're not pushing for it either. So it's sort of like the problem with Oakland is that if they can't justify the rents and or, or the the for sale amounts, they just they're not they're going to focus on the North Beach or the Marina, you know. But the other odd thing with that, the the slight densification heading more towards zoning as of right or building as of right took about two years or so. It was at first rebuffed. 
not just by the sunset, but they had the alliance of a number of progressives on the east side of the city who saw a tactical advantage to going after the mayor and the housing department. And only when it was then kind of changed and moved and modified and beefed up to kind of a more pure thing did it pass. And there's been one project approved. So it's a start, mm -hmm. a small start. Question. Um, wait, let's, oh, okay. Go here and then we'll come back. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you haven't uh, mentioned anything about the trade unions. What, if, what effect are the trade unions having in the cost of development and in their support for more housing? Or are they a hindrance to you as a developer, Mr. Vanguard? Oh, um, well, cities like San Francisco are very much um, trade union friendly, of course. I, I think it's just a part of the puzzle. I don't think it necessarily, <coughs> I mean, it does affect the cost of construction, certainly. But um, that's just part of, I don't see that as a problem to answer your question necessarily, yeah. Are there, I'm just curious, if, I mean, we've heard that the Mayor's Office of Housing struck a deal with some of the unions to do modular construction on a homeless housing development, uh, and that, but there's been resistance to modular, which potentially can lower costs because you're assembling part of the building off-site, right, and then transporting it in. So, I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? Like, are there ways that we could bring costs down by striking appropriate deals with labor where we still have good labor standards, but... Or some... is that another third rail in the <laughs> sense of... Well, the, the quantitative answer to your question is about 15 to 25 percent uh, cost increase of hard cost to uh, pay for prevailing wages. But, but that said, um, San Francisco is largely a union town, and so it's, it's sort of like that old jazz tune, you know, compared to what? Uh, if you go to areas where it's really a condition of public funding to use prevailing wages or federal Davis-Bacon standards, then you do see this, this incremental cost difference. So I, I think you're sort of left with the kinds of negotiations that James described okay. <clears throat> in, in San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, I, actually, I got two questions. The first part is, do we know, what is the projection of new uh, population increase to San Francisco? Uh, in the say next five years? Well, in the sure. 2014 to 2022 period, the city of San Francisco is tasked by ABAG with providing about 47, 48,000 units of housing, which equates to a population increase of about uh, 120,000 people, 100,000 100, people. And I think we need to keep in mind it's a little bit of a self fulfilling prophecy. I mean, the more that we don't build housing, it makes it more and more expensive and it limits who can be here, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, we can set these goals for ourselves, but it does um, kind of... Well, what is the population in the city right now? 870. 870 almost 900,000 people. Yeah. And so at one point it was down below 700? Yeah, 780. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was, okay. So it didn't go down as much in the, as others. In the 50s, right? Well, I well, think what 780 was. No, I think it was in the 80s, wasn't it? I think I think it was. No, I think it was down to about 680 or something. It was. It was just 50s? below in 1980. Was its low point. And then it was. Like, oh, and then it's been coming rebounding since 1980. And your second question. What is uh, uh, I know, city government is spending a lot of money on homeless problem. Seems like that problem is becoming bigger mm -hmm. instead of. Last year, so what? What? What is the city doing with all that money? I I heard some place say it's a half a billion a year. Wow, this is getting into essay questions. <laughs> I mean, that uh -huh. that that's such a huge <laughs> issue itself. I mean, I you know I would just direct you to uh, we have a new department of homelessness and supportive housing, and the the idea there is to kind of coordinate better the the funding. I mean, not that it was being poorly used before necessarily, but it was going through a lot of different channels. I mean, I've heard a figure much less than what you've said, but still a lot, around 200 million or so. 280 million. 280. Yeah. So about you know half of what you mentioned, but still a lot. And it is going through a lot of different Department of Public Health. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I would look to them. They're coming out with a plan. It may have already been released that it. it's out. Um, a five-year plan to reduce homelessness. So that's at least could give you a sense of how it's being used and what the goals are. So much pressure. I 
also have two questions. Two is a popular number today. Um, one is for Christine, and the other one is for the man in the middle, <coughs> whose name might be David, but that's a guess. David. It, it, it is. is. David. I did it. My name is David <laughs> yes. as well. Yeah. I'll start with you. You said that the answer to these problems is production. And you also offered a bunch of ways, or a limited bunch of ways, that we could um, increase production. And the main thing was to make more progressive all the incentives we have. And you offered easy solutions like getting rid of the mortgage deduction and revoking Proposition 13. I didn't hear anything that you mentioned that sounded like something the city of San Francisco could do, and I wish you'd go into that a little bit. That's number one. Uh, okay. Uh, see, I feel a little bit like I need to correct the record here, but uh, maybe just going to your, um, uh, to your question. Um, <clears throat> San Francisco is already stretching the limit. Uh, when we look at the city policy with regard to development impact fees for affordable housing and inclusionary housing obligations on developers for new production, we're almost at the head of the class nationally. Uh, San Francisco was the first city in the state post-redevelopment to pass a voter-approved bond to replace some, not all, but some of the lost uh, uh, tax increment revenue that previously was going into affordable housing. Uh, the HOPE SF program is another land value capture mechanism. Um, I actually did not say that production was the solution. I actually said, uh, I said that production is not going to address the affordability crisis. Um, so um, it's a bit tough to, you know, I, I think the homeless issue, um, you know, I, I mean, San Francisco, it's a very tough pro problem and it's a critical, pro it's, it's a measure of who we are as a nation and as a community. I just returned, we, we do uh, energy and housing work in Europe. I just returned from Brussels, Amsterdam, and The Hague. I saw no homeless person, not a single one. I talked to them. And it's just we as a society uh, provide <laughs> for them, not only shelter, but the services that they need. And it was just, you know, shameful. Um, but the city is really doing quite a lot, which is, which is frustrating, right? Because we've produced more housing than we have in, I don't know, in history, John, but in, in certainly in the last... 40, 50 five, years. I mean, this has been the most production, certainly in the last... 35 years, San Francisco has seen. And guess what? We have record prices and record rents. So the notion that production is going <laughs> to solve our price problem is, is a fool's errand here. Um, you know, what could the city do? I suppose we could turn to the voters and talk about a permanent source for affordable housing rather than periodic bond measures. And, um, but, you know, how much blood can we extract from the stone? I mean, we have other needs in the city as well. Yeah, that's actually a good point. And the, the quick question for Christine. I can, I can yell. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have one question per person and give to everybody. Oh, Christine, you said that your solution, or one solution you proposed, was that the cities be required to maximize their zoning envelope. The, um, I just wonder how you do that. Do you tell people with single-family homes, we're going to charge you a lot of money unless you, unless you put on the second and third story? What? I mean, you can't do that, so what are you talking about? And them, because I'm never going to get this mic again. Will somebody tell me why all you guys are talking about five-story conveniently and maximizing certain obvious kinds of zoning areas when the <coughs> UBC now allows you to have five stories over a, a reinforced concrete box? Why aren't well, you talking about six stories? We're talking casually. I mean, we're just using that as a round, as an easy number. But so Six is a big number. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, quick thing. Uh, we won't get into the details, but there is something to construction methods where you get it above a certain story. It's not five, it's more like seven or eight. And then you start going into a different construction method and there's different costs associated with that. So there is a, there is a line where cheaper, more expensive. Um, and then just to quickly get to your question about maximizing zoning. Uh, no, I don't think you need to necessarily have a requirement uh, <coughs> like you must demolish your single family home and rebuild it with three units. But we have all kinds of permits at all times with people coming in and saying, I want to extend my house. I want to put on an extra story. I want to uh, uh, blow out the back. I want to excavate beneath. And I think that it would be fairly easy for the city to have incentives 
financially or through the planning code or otherwise to say, well, if you're going to expand your building in that way, we want to incentivize you to add an extra unit, to add an ADU. Um, I think you know you can't force people to do things, but you can create a system where one choice is easier than the other. Yeah, it, it, we we gloss over that, but I do think for San Francisco, the accessory dwelling unit uh, uh, approach could um, could produce. You know, I don't know. Has a, has a census been done? Yeah, I mean, uh, 660 ADUs are currently. Uh, and maybe uh, under, explain but, uh, yeah, oh, to the group sorry. what ADUs are. Yes, uh, accessory granny dwelling units. Granny units in the backyard. Yeah, granny, so granny units in the backyard all across or the, the country. Or... Yeah, all across the country, people <clears throat> tend to think of them as, as backyard cottages. But actually in San Francisco, the majority of accessory dwelling units that are permitted nice. are existing space within existing multi-unit buildings. So think if you've ever been into an apartment building where maybe half of the second floor was storage. You can have potentially two or three accessory dwelling units. But so is it hundreds, different. Christine, or thousands that could be built? Oh, I mean, I mean the, oh, the yeah. capacity. Yeah. Is, What's the capacity? That's thousands. my question. Thousands. Yeah, I think the capacity is, is quite large. In the last Vancouver. year or two, in the last year or two, we've had 600. That's what yeah. Christine yeah. was running. And that's, Vancouver, Canada has done quite wonderful things with accessory dwelling units. And so I, I think that that is actually something the city could do. And, and that's a great way, uh, if I may just comment on that, to maintain existing neighborhood character but add potentially more units. And so that's a win-win. And more of those types of programs where you can keep Coal Valley looking like Coal Valley, but allow more people to live in Coal Valley within the existing framework would be great. Yes, one question. On the demand side, do you think cities are too aggressively courting new businesses? Like Mountain View would say, oh, you know, you could create a huge office park, but I expect people to live in Sunnyvale, and San Francisco would say the same thing and say, people could commute from the East Bay, but if there isn't enough coordination across the different counties, it's, it's gonna be a, a kind of a lose-lose situation. Okay, I'll start. <laughs> and then everyone else, can, I'll keep it super short. So yes, we mentioned fiscalization and land use, and that's a real thing. So there are real incentives for, or for local cities to want to have commercial development and sort of uh, economic engines coming to their cities versus having a lot of housing, right? So that's a real incentive problem that we have. But on the flip side, here's one thing that I would say uh, in favor of some of the cities who, who sometimes do say things like that. It's not great regionally, but in a, history has shown us that economic engines are how you get nice things, right? We're talking about high-speed rail, coming through the Bay Area for up from LA. Uh, we have billions of dollars, in, in at least in San Francisco, of infra infrastructure development, the Transbay Terminal, um, potentially talking about a second Transbay crossing. All of these things happen because there's an economic engine that is being serviced that people who live here will also benefit from. So there's sort of um, some, some a mixed bag of incentives that cities have, but I think I do think that the pendulum has swung a little bit too far in terms of too many localities um, going going for that gold ring of building their economic engine over putting roofs over people's heads. Can I can I add to that, John? Briefly? Super quick because we've got. Well, I, I I liked uh, Sam Licardo's comment about not. Uh, offering uh, subsidies and incentives to Amazon to locate their headquarters in San Jose. He, he just wasn't going to play that game. Uh, he, he viewed the, the game of economic development or smokestack chasing, if you will, through tax subsidies as, a, at the end of the day, a, a losing proposition for cities. Yeah. Um, I think probably this is about the last question. So following up on that, that regional question about the, the benefits that accrue to the region from the um, businesses being incented to locate in the region, and how we solve the broader development problem. Um, I recently heard about a, a public-private group, I don't know if Spur was involved, with 30, <coughs> 30 to 50 regional leaders and business leaders um, trying to arrive at a sort of grand bargain on housing regionally. Have you heard about that, any of you? Um, Casa. And is there a CASA strategy? Is this the Silicon Valley? Uh, you know, it was, it was, it, it was discussed at the recent Business Times San Francisco Structures Symposium where the mayor spoke about his housing goals. Okay. And so my question is, have you heard of it? And then secondarily, I guess, what do you think its chances for success are? Because I've heard at least a couple of you mention tonight that you didn't think asking individual Bay Area municipalities to give up any of their sovereign rights was, was even worth discussing. But it seems to me that there may be some working groups 
working on that? Because it seems to me it's a regional issue, not just a city of San Francisco issue. So thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't heard of anything, but I, I, think, I think I agree um, with what was mentioned here before, which is that state legislation is ultimately going to be the most powerful because ABAG, Association of Bay Area Governments, as you mentioned, does have goals of housing production, but there are no teeth. There's, no, there's nothing forcing anybody to do anything. Scott Weiner, for example, proposed something at the state level to hold cities individually accountable that do not produce housing. In cities like Healdsburg, for example. Um, so I, I, I don't know about that, but I would reiterate state level legislation would be the most powerful. I, I think you are referring to the CASA strategy. Um, so, yeah. So that's an initiative that uh, was talked about for a long time, but really kicked off this year. And there are, I don't know if it's 30, but there are a lot of groups involved. Uh, SPUR is one of the collaborators. Uh, you have Bay Area Council, Silicon Valley Leadership Group, uh, a lot of the affordable housing groups, uh, and a lot of the housing MPH. equity groups and equity, equity groups are involved as well. Um, and they've had a few meetings. And yeah, they are trying to see, you know, what are some regional strategies? Uh, for example, everyone sort of came with their memo with their ideas, and now it's sort of baked, being baked into one set of CASA strategies. Um, there's tax incentives. There's regional governance incentives. There's a, there's a lot of different um, ideas that people have. You, you could propose a general obligation bond for the nine county region, and mm -hmm. put that to the voters. And I, I you know, I'm not a, I'm not a pollster, but uh, I mean, if there's a moment where there's um, appetite for something like that, it might be now. Mm -hmm. Now, now that said, um, one of the new statutes passed in uh, Sacramento and signed by the governor was a housing bond for the state, which will be on the ballot next year. So I'm not sure we want them to be competing with one mm -hmm. another. But, but again, I think regionalism is. I think it's really very problematic. I mean, to really uh, give up those sovereign rights. And if there are fiscal strategies that uh, uh, multiple jurisdictions can contribute to without hurting their own general fund, okay, um, sure. But that's effectively enlarging the pie. You know, you're not going to ask um, Emeryville or El Cerrito to give up some of their general fund revenue to go fund Hayward. That, that's not going to happen. Yeah, it, it's, in, I think we're just about 8 o'clock, so we should probably wrap up. Um, I'm a history major, and so all these things I listen to, I think of all these entertaining stories, including the lost opportunity for strong regional government in the 1970s that came and went because people wanted things to be perfect rather than start. But I want to thank you all for being here. This is a terrific panel. Uh, I could have had any one of them for 90 minutes, and we'd still be coming up short on topics. So I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank all four of you for being here, Jonathan, David, Christine, and James. And I want to thank the Mechanics Institute for putting this on and even having wine for you guys in the back. <laughs> thank you for this incredibly informative panel. And I also want to thank um, Mechanics Institute member Michael St. James for initiating this idea and the panel. So if you're watching, Michael, thank you. And see you at the next program. <laughs>